Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Uh, I had a, I had many opportunities to share with you, sir. Uh, Dr. Karna Karan was kind enough to operate my cases in my nursing home, like tonsillectomy and others. I have a personal uh, introduction to him. Uh, and uh, going to the topic, I think your date of birth was eighth uh, December, nineteen fifty-six. Qualifications: MS, ENT, DLO, and MBBS. You did an MMC, uh, DLO, MMC, MS, ENT also in uh, MMC. I think you finished in uh, MS, ENT in nineteen ninety-one. Joined Tamil Nadu Medical Services in eighty-nine. Rural service for two years and three months. He was the director of medical education. Side, uh, Stanley Medical College, twelve years, MMC three years, Kanyakumari Medical College one year, Government Vellur Medical College nine months, Chengalpattu Medical College three years and three months, Private College also had experience, SRM Medical College three years and uh, two months, Madhya Medical College two years, teaching experience for undergraduates twenty three years, almost like a silver jubilee, uh, PGs for eighteen years. And I was examiner in uh, Dr. Medi M G R Medical University and uh, Dr. N T R University, Andhra Pradesh, Rajiv Gandhi University, Karnataka, Kerala University in Kerala, Pondicherry University, Balaji Medical College, Kurumpet, Chennai. E N T question papers setter for various private medical colleges. Given guest lectures in I M A meetings. Organized various state level and national level conferences and live uh, cadaver dissection and uh, show. Uh, workshops in Stanley Medical College and Madras Medical College. Chairperson in various conferences and live surgery uh, workshops attended various national South Zone and uh, Tamil Nadu conferences. While working in Stanley Hospital, presented various papers in South Zone, Tamil Nadu and Chennai City conferences. Removed a 15 centimeter long fish from the trachea of a fisherman and saved his life of that fisherman. He was a he is a member. He was a member of IMA Kodumbakkam branch and uh, Indian Society of Oncology, Otology Association of uh, ENT All India branch. Special additional experiences of doing allergy tests for ENT allergy and bronchial asthma for over uh, thirty years. Done allergy tests for uh, four thousand cases and cured and controlled the diseases. And I was an eminent ENT surgeon. I had a personal experience with him. He used to operate cases in my hospital, and uh, and we are very sorry to have this uh, unfortunate uh, event. Live look. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Over to you. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you go ahead, sir. I am sharing the CV of. Uh, Nagendra Bhupati. Nagendra Bhupati. Sir, Nagendra Bhupati has got a voluminous CV. It's got shot down and uh, say some, I mean, very important words. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Nagendra Bhupati Sengutuvan, for our match. He's one of the few cardiologists in India to have undergone structured training in tranquilizer therapies. And formed with coronary angioplasty and standing form of USA. He has been the speakers of most of the international cardiology forums, forums, and fellowship. So many awards. So many working places in the in this area. There are so many awards, numerous. <laughs> and academic and educational positions is long, another long list. He has done research publication grants uh, and grants from CHIP, clonal hemopoietic cell inner treatment potential, and publications more than 33 PubMed publications, uh, international, national journals. He has been sort of sought after speakers of most inter Indian international cardiology forums. Welcome to. Sir, you unmute yourself. Why are you doing, sir? You unmute. Uh, can I can I share my screen or how are we going to? Call it, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
Sir, you have sent me your presentation. Sir, there are videos there. Oh, okay. So, you want me to make you the host? Uh, that that will be awesome, sir. Sorry. Uh, hold on. I'll make you the host. But at the end of the meeting, before I reclaim it, the Yosanji meeting end up at the third hour. Take words. Uh, right, sir. You are the host. Can you share your screen? Is it possible now? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen, sir. Uh, I hope the screen is visible now. Am I right, sir? Yes. Yeah. Sir, your, your time is 20 minutes, sir. Okay. And uh, you can take one or two minutes extra. Sir. Okay, no problem, sir. So, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, IMA Kodambakam. Thank you, Academic Coordination, Dr. Venkata Sai, uh, Dr. Yuma, sir, Dr. Bhupati, sir, Dr. K, sir, and Dr. Priya Karan for providing this opportunity. So, I will be discussing about management of aortic stenosis in 2020. So, these are all the topics where we will be discussing it's diagnosing aortic stenosis, natural history, managing severe aortic stenosis patients in 2020, and different modalities of management which are available at present. The picture on the right says shows a normal aortic valve which is thin, which can move freely up and down. The picture on the right extreme shows the calcified stenotic aortic valve, which is a diseased one. In general, if you look at the percentage, as we grow older and older, the chances to have aortic stenosis goes to such an extent that after 75 years, even 10% of individuals can have severe aortic stenosis. As in patients who are going to present at a younger age, if you look at the younger age, two thirds of patients who are going to have less than 70 years to have a bicuspid aortic valve related aortic stenosis, while more than 40% will have a bicuspid aortic stenosis, they are going to be more than uh, 70 years. So, as we grow older and older, the chances to have aortic stenosis because of rheumatic heart disease decreases, bicuspid aortic valve decreases, and degenerative aortic stenosis increases. So, when to diagnose severe aortic stenosis? We all know about the history, clinical presentation of aortic stenosis. In general, the most common symptom of patients, uh, patients with aortic stenosis is dyspnea. The dyspnea happens because of increased LV and diastolic pressure or failure to provide an increased cardiac output during exertion. So, exertion dyspnea is the most common symptom in patients with aortic stenosis, followed by chest pain and syncope. Syncope can happen in patients with aortic stenosis because of fixed cardiac output. That is, the patient is not able to increase the cardiac output do, do whenever the patient exerts himself. Or sometimes after exertion, there's going to be peripheral vasodilatation. And that peripheral vasodilatation is going to further decrease the cardiac inflow. And with the given the presence of fixed cardiac output, this patient can develop pre syncope leading to syncope. And uh, uh, other arrhythmic etiologies like bradyarrhythmia, tachyarrhythmia can also cause syncope in these patients. Coming to chest pain, chest pain can ha happen in patients with aortic because there's going to be a stenotic aortic valve. The left ventricular muscle is so thick so the demand for um, blood flow for the LV muscle is significantly higher. There's going to be a significant uh, change in the supply and mismatch. There's going to be increased demand, but the supply is going to be decreased because of fixed cardiac output. And the LV uh, and diastolic pressure... Dr. Nagendra Bhupati may interrupt. I think you'll have to restart the Facebook share. In the lower right section, the last three buttons... Uh, there, there may be a button which says uh, share to Facebook. After the recording, screen share record to the button. Sir, bottom share screen. Stop screen, share screen. Uh, not on top, at the bottom. Uh, I don't see anything in the bottom actually. Can you, but it says live on Facebook, but Facebook is not running. What, what do you want me to do, sir? Uh, oh, no, sir. You just go ahead. Okay. Sir, I think Facebook is running only, sir. People are able to watch it on Facebook, sir. Okay. If you are able to watch, then go ahead. You know, my okay. Facebook is not running. Please oh, go ahead. My brother Sorry is able disturb. to watch it, sir. Sorry to disturb. No problem. This pain in patients with aortic stenosis happens because, because of increased demand and decreased supply. And 50% of the patient, if you I do a coronary angiography, they may be having associated coronary artery disease. The pathogenesis that happens uh, in coronary artery disease and aortic stenosis, they are kind of so amalgamated, the, the calcific deposit, cholesterol deposits that's going to be seen on the aortic valve 
and inside the coronary vessel they are almost the same so the pathogen is there is a significant amount of amalgamation uh, that is that is there between the pathogens is between uh, uh, coronary artery disease and aortic stenosis so this is the way how aort patients with aortic stenosis are classified at present this, this kind of classification have uh, we we classified these patient only after 2013 into four stages stage a stage b stage c and stage d stage a is any risk factors for example any history of rheumatic fever and a history of hypertension these patients are prone to develop aortic stenosis later i have history of aortic scler sclerosis that is the fibrotic valve but not uh, thickened enough not calcified enough to increase the gradients so these patients are at risk progressive aortic stenosis stage b that is any patient who has got a mild or moderate aortic stenosis when i say mild or moderate aortic stenosis we predominantly classify the aortic stenosis based on three characteristics number one is aortic valve area number two is mean gradient number three is peak velocity Uh, velocity of the blood across the aortic valve so it, there is no need to go in detail about the classification uh, of uh, mild moderate let's look at c stage c is any patient who has got a who has got a severe aortic stenosis and stage d is any patient who has got severe aortic stenosis who is symptomatic so basically stage a is a uh, risk factor for developing aortic stenosis stage b is mild or moderate aortic stenosis stage c is severe aortic stenosis but these patients are asymptomatic patients stage d is symptomatic aortic stenosis patients and further classification is to type 1 type 2 type 3 there's no need to go in detail about these particular stages the, but we need to remember about stage t stage c is asymptomatic aortic stenosis stage d is symptomatic aortic stenosis so we know the natural history of aortic stenosis way back in 1960s so how people initially diagnose aortic stenosis in 1960s predominantly clinical examination there is going to be a, a s1 and followed by a long drowning mid systolic aortic murmur which is late peaking towards the end of the systole that's going to be s2 if depending on the etiology of the aortic stenosis the a2 can be soft it can be loud or even sometimes because of amalgamation of a2 and p2 there can be single s2 another additional characteristic finding in patients with aortic stenosis presence of lv left ventricular systolic uh, uh, fourth heart sound these are all the characteristic finding with which even patients were sent for surgery uh, in 1960s there is no clear cut definition in identifying these patients whether to have a peak gradient a mean gradient of 50 40 what exactly is the severe aortic stenosis less than 1.7 0.5 we exactly don't know in uh, 1960s there come the natural study uh, which is done by dr brownwall and dr ross in 1968 where they followed series of patients with aortic stenosis and they found that any patient with aortic stenosis they are actually doing good till the time they develop some kind of symptoms so once they develop symptoms there's a significant downhill course in their course look at this point the patient who are here they are absolutely normal as compared to her any other individual who who is not having aortic valve disease once they develop symptoms here with syncope the the kind of the 50% survival rate goes to 3 years with heart failure the 50% survival goes to 2 years while with angina the 50% survival goes to 5 years so any symptomatic patients this is the first study first documented prospective uh, aortic stenosis natural history study we showed that patient with aortic stenosis should be operated did you know that way back in 1960s so uh, there is no role of uh, mechanical there is no role of medical therapy in patient with severe aortic stenosis this is a point i would like to stress there is absolutely no role of medicines that can help in patient with severe aortic stenosis who are symptomatic this point we know six decades before itself so what are all the in investigatory modalities that are currently utilized in dealing with such patients with aortic stenosis we start with chest x ray ecg that that may show left ventricular hypertrophy with or without strain echo this is the most important investigation even point of ultrasonogram machine is currently recommended to diagnose aortic stenosis whenever you hear a bedside murmur so we classify aortic stenosis as i told earlier when you have an aortic valve area of less than 1 cm square normally it is something of more than 2.5 peak velocity of 4 mm meter per second normally the velocity is less than 2 mean gradient of 40 normal mean gradient is less than 10 so whenever the aortic we, we reach this category of severe aortic stenosis aortic valve area peak velocity of the blood across the aortic valve and mean gradient difference between the left ventricle and the ascending aorta which has which is which has happened because of aortic stenosis we classify them into severe aortic stenosis cardiac catheterization is recommended only if there is going to be discordance between clinical symptoms and echocardiogram presentation in a particular individual and it is a must before proceeding with any form of invasive therapy in these patients 
to rule out associated coronary artery disease. In most of the individuals, if they are going to be more than 40 years, we recommend doing a coronary angiography. That's mandatory either before surgical therapy or transcatheter therapy. That this is the detailed algorithm that is recommended for patients with iotexnosis. There's no need to go in depth uh, regarding this particular talk. So we know that iotexnosis is symptomatic. They need uh, they need uh, aortic valve replacement. There is no medical therapy that can cure aortic valve stenosis. It is this is an obstructed door. It cannot be cured with medicines. So, but the operative risk is way back in 1970s and something around 10 percent. A patient goes in to operation. That this is NIH data and no need to tell NIH is the one of the leading uh, performer in during those times. Even that the operative mortality risk was 9 10 percent. The adverse outcome that happened over a period of 10 years is, is equivalent to nearly around 50 to 75 percent had some kind of some kind of other kind of events. The available valve during the time was starved valve, well, so ball and cage valve. This is currently not available. So these these are the uh, problems. They they thought that we are treating we are making one form of disease into another form of disease. So they waited for a long time because of perioperative mortality was significantly higher and even post-operative care many, many, multiple patients developed embolic event or the degeneration of the tissue valve if they have if they would have received a tissue valve. What exactly is the natural history currently for a patient with aortic stenosis? In general, if you look, the aortic valve area decreases by 0.1 centimeter square per year. Velocity increases by 0.3 meter per second and the gradient increases something around 7 millimeter per mercury. So as long as you don't belong to this category of 4 meter per second, you are doing reasonably okay. That is the key point that I would like to stress here. How about asymptomatic aortic stenosis? This is a famous study by Pelika et al. from Mayo Clinic where they found that if the patient is going to have severe aortic stenosis and the patient has got has got any symptom, has not got any symptoms, that is absolutely asymptomatic, they followed this patient. They found that at the end of five years, 75% of the patient, they are either dead or they have received aortic valve replacement. So what is the difference between these category of patients who are either dead or uh, recovered or received aortic valve replacement as compared to individuals who have not got any aortic valve replacement? They found that this patient had a vel higher velocity, that is their peak velocity was more than 5.5, or they had a significant amount of calcium on the aortic valve. So these are all the characteristics what we use currently to identify patients who are having severe aortic stenosis, but are asymptomatic, who may require the early intervention to prevent death or a kind of emergency aortic valve replacement. So as of now, we are very clear in patient with severe aortic stenosis, any patient who is symptomatic, he needs a surgery. Any patient who has got LV dysfunction, who the impact of aortic stenosis has already occurred on the LV, LV, LVEF, that is the LVEF dropped to less than 50%, they need surgery, there's no question about it, they need intervention. And AVR in an asymptomatic individual can be considered, when I say can be considered, it is called, it's called as 2A indication, when the patient has got a critical aortic stenosis, that is more than 5.5 meter per second velocity, or severe valve calcium with a VMAX progression, that is every year you're following this patient, Initially, the velocity was 4 meter per second. Now, today, uh, last year, today, the velocity is 4.5. That means he is falling into the category of a rapid progressor. He can have a sudden cardiac event, which can be 1 to 3 percent per year. So, patient who has developed a severe uh, PAH, pulmonary artery hypertension, or in whom there is a diastolic heart failure that is documented by BNP, which is three times. These patients and the European Heart Disease Guidelines currently recommend uh, these patients who are asymptomatic can go for surgery or intervention. So my, most of us know, don't think that aortic stenosis is a benign disease. No, it's not. Severe aortic stenosis has got a much worse prognosis than more many metastatic cancers. If the patient has got a severe aortic stenosis who is symptomatic because of heart failure, the five-year mortal, the five-year survival rate is significantly lower as compared to many metastatic cancers, that is lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, ovarian, and prostate cancer. So we are, we are, we the amount of importance what we give to. Uh, these kind of patients who has got a metastatic uh, cancer should be given to these kind of patients who has got aortic stenosis who is having severe symptoms because of heart failure. Unless we are going to treat them, I don't think they will make even a couple of years. So how did we treat these patients before? We, were, we have been using cardiopulmonary bypass. We stopped the heart either during diastole or systole by using cardioprejac drugs and open the chest and replace the valve. This is how a uh, patient with aortic valve replacement on day zero and day one looks. What is the role of transcathetic therapy in aortic valve disease? Way back in 1990s, when Dr. Elian Cribier from France conceptualized the idea, people were thinking it is never possible. It's impossible, cannot be stented. 
is too dangerous coronary artery there are a lot of additional structure which is near the aortic valve like coronary arteries interventricular septum conduction tissues we cannot do it that's what uh, people who didn't believe his concept uh, questioned him but he put, they initially did a kind of in vitro study they found that aortic valve is stentable just like a coronary arteries and they found that it works well in 1994 itself but it took almost 8 years for him to identify an appropriate patient this is a pro, this is the guy in whom the first procedure was done way back in 2002 the very sick patient 57 year old guy who has been who's got multiple uh, uh, medical comorbidities ejection fraction was only 10% severe aortic stenosis in whom an aortic transcatheter aortic valve was done successfully this is the first individual who got it done and is the first doctor who did it way back in 2002 I, the uh, the rate at which transcatheter therapy for aortic valve progressed very rapidly and just for the information of the audience this is how a transcatheter aortic valve replacement is done currently the transcatheter aortic valve re- this is the video that clearly says that the aortic valve in this particular portion that separates the left ventricle and the ascending aorta the valve is uh, res- having restricted movement uh, movements with a thickened uh, leaflet with calcium deposited in the aortic valve the the small holes what we are seeing nearby is the coronary ostium in general we go through a femoral artery we put a small wire all the way into the left ventricle after that we put a big tube that goes all the way from the femoral artery into the ascending aorta this is the balloon that goes across the aortic valve and dilates the aortic valve so that we can deliver the uh, valve comfortably in the next step the valve is open initially balloon aortic valve was uh, done for patient with aortic stenosis who in whom surgery cannot be contemplated but there is going to be 60% to 70% re stenosis at the end of 6 uh, months and patient becomes much more symptomatic after first episode of balloon aortic valvuloplasty so the balloon aortic valvuloplasty currently is not being utilized uh, as a as a kind of a permanent therapy it's only a bridge to transplant or bridge to any non cardiac surgery now look here we are trying to position the valve across the aortic valve now the valve is inflated the balloon is inflated and it delivers the valve there are two types of valve which are currently available one is a balloon expanding valve other one is a self expanding valve in this particular video what we he has been utilized is a balloon expanding valve i look at the way how the valve functions after the after uh, deploying the valve you can see the valve leaflet which are normally moving if you could remember the previous video the valve was not moving at all so this is how a tra- transcatheter aortic valve replacement is done currently so what happened with transcatheter uh, the the rapidity at which the technology help the cardiologist to do this procedure currently this is the most commonly uh, most commonly uh, done procedure next to coronary artery disease uh, regarding structural adult structural feed so the evidence for this particular procedure is robust more than uh, 3000 300000 to 400000 have been uh, received this valve throughout the globe it all started with patients in whom surgery cannot be uh, done way back in 2008 now this has been compared equivalent to surgical aortic valve procedure in patients in whom the surgical risk is even low so this is the category of patient in whom surgery cannot be done started with high surgical risk started with intermediate surgical risk and started with low surgical risk so it was gra- properly done highly selected individuals started from very very high risk patients in whom surgery surgeons have uh, declined to do the surgery because of surgical mortality associated with these individuals going back all the way to low risk individuals who are young who are 65 70 70 70 mean age is 72 73 here in whom the outcome of surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacement are equivalent to add more fda uh, the us fda has approved the therapy transcatheter aortic valve in, in in patient with aortic stenosis irrespective of all the uh, any kind of risk associated with these patients the only thing what we currently consider is we the patient should be we should the predicted survival for a particular individual should be more than one year that is the only thing what we consider at this point of time this is the way how we do tower in our cath lab it's a minimalist approach most of the time it is done using conscious sedation two room uh, to one take up there will be uh, two operators one surgeon on back uh, standby one perfusionist on standby two uh, uh, scrub nurse one floor nurse and a technician yeah center line is not usually placed police catheter is not usually placed and we prefer putting a radial line for the anesthetist to monitor the pressure 
we in general prefer going through transfemoral artery initially in patient who are having severe peripheral artery disease transfemoral could not be done so initially the people have utilized trans aortic procedure and trans axillary procedure now these are uh, these uh, alternative routes are absolute we are not using these routes currently we are using either trans carotid or trans axillary approach so we do the procedure days uh, two hours later patient goes to icu first day he stay first day he stays in the icu next day he goes to the ward and after 48 hours he go, he goes out, goes to his home this is how the trans catheter therapy has evolved in patient managing patients with aortic stenosis so what exactly is partner 3 trial partner 3 trial is a trial that compared the effect of aortic valve replacement by surgery and aortic valve replacement through trans catheter valve in patient with severe aortic stenosis it found that tavr is better in reducing mortality stroke and rehospitalization in addition to acute kidney injury bleeding and new onset atrial fibrillation and tavr is equivalent to surgery in pacemakers vascular complications there is significant uh, new onset left bundle branch block in patient who underwent tavr because the valve is going to lie very close to the conduction system so because of this minimalist approach because of this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, advancement that has taken in the field of structural intervention cardiology in adult patients the utilization of these procedure has dramatically increased to such an extent that in 2007 uh, it has overtaken surgical aortic valve in 2019 2019 2017 it was overtaken and 2019 the predominant of aortic valve replacement done in throughout the globe is through uh, trans catheter therapy it is expected that the volume is going to increase uh, and so nearly 300000 will be done uh, in 2025 itself so having said all these things the surgical aortic valve number didn't come so it is if you look at the, the gross numbers the surgical aortic valve remains the same but trans catheter is significantly increased because the patients who have not been uh, advised surgery in the sense who have been declined surgery more and more those category of patients have been engulfed into this trans catheter therapy so the volume goes higher and higher till now but from 2020 onwards we are we are we are kind of we are going to face a situation where the surgical avr is going to come down and trans catheter avr is going to go up the most important question that is put forth in, in front of patient with trans catheter aortic valve therapy is the durability of the valve surgical aortic valve no question it's time tested but look at the surgical aortic valve performance at the end of 9 years look at this the predominant amount of failure of surgical aortic valve happens by around 9 to 10 years uh, 50% of the patient would have got degenerated aortic valve degenerated surgical bioprosthetic valve while the rest of the 50% would have got their valve replaced by by 10 years so the valve durability of uh, surgical aortic valve is not uh, it's 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 a sub no we know that 50% 30 to 50% will be degenerated by 10 to 15 years the rest of the patients some of them would have gone for replacement that's the most important thing that should not be forgotten they compared a bench bench side test for trans catheter aortic valve they found that it is equivalent to surgical aortic valve for 25 years these are all the durability studies that shows that at present that uh, we have got a 10 year data which shows that the dur durability of trans catheter therapy is equivalent to surgical aortic valve at present at 10 years these are all the uh, short shorter duration studies 5 years 6 years 7 years and 8 years they found that it is actually equivalent to surgical aortic valve this one important randomized study this found the reverse of what was expected actually the durability was better with the trans catheter aortic valve therapy rather than with surgical aortic valve therapy because most importantly as a trans catheter therapy specialist we put a bigger valve as compared to surgeon they put a smaller valve so the the degeneration is directly proportional to the aortic valve area what you you uh, received at the end of the procedure but for a particular individual if you look in the next chart for example the here the uh, blue color is the uh, trans catheter and the red is the uh, surgical aortic valve the surgery the procedure happens here and look at this there is going to be a higher is a higher amount of aortic valve area in patients who have received a trans catheter therapy as compared to patients who have got their surgical valve done similarly look at the gradient the blue is the uh, gradient there is a significantly higher gradient in patients with surgical aortic valve therapy as compared to trans catheter therapy at the end of 6 years so this therapy this this is the only randomized study in whom the, the data is available which says that if not in if not superior at least definitely the trans catheter therapy is equivalent to uh, surgical aortic valve therapy in by means of durability how about putting a valve inside a valve many patients who have got surgical aortic valve before uh, the second option because of various comorbidities they they may be declined in such individuals uh, putting a valve inside a surgical aortic valve it's very feasible technically it's much more easier than Uh, putting a native valve aortic valve the only problem is this this may create some uh, reaccess issues to the coronary so we do ct scan before all trans catheter procedures to i predict the kind of coronary artery uh, involvement whether it is feasible or not by uh, from the ct scan and proceed with the procedure 
it is not an individual person decision to go with either surgical aortic valve or a transcatheter aortic valve in 2020 having shown seen that by the results of transcatheter aortic valve therapy is equivalent to surgical aortic valve therapy the of the every patient with aortic stenosis is more than at least 50 by 60 years where in whom you are considering a bioprosthetic surgical aortic valve should be seen by a heart team which includes a uh, interventional cardiologist cardiologist referring physician anesthesiologist and a cardiac surgeon be you should after confirming the diagnosis we get a ct scan done to identify the feasibility of transcatheter therapy and surgical therapy and other associated organ tests like pft and carotid doppler can also be done to assess the risk of an individual to develop stroke or kind of problem in getting extubated so every patient should be assessed for the risk to have taver and risk to have saver most of the time the risk to have taver is going to be significantly lower as compared to risk to have a saver surgical aortic valve replacement there are currently three fda devices approved in the united states and we have in india we do have another c mark device which is called as my valve this is a balloon expandable valve coming from an edward sapien valve we call it as sapien 3 this is a self expanding valve which we call it as evolute pro and this is another indian made indigenous valve which is called as my valve the there's a randomized study that is going to that is already happening now comparing this my valve indian valve versus the uh, us valve we will be expecting the results in another three couple of years so uh, having discussed about all the uh, transcatheter therapies let's discuss about few cases in whom we have done this therapy the 72 year old male who got multiple comorbid illness he has been diagnosed to have an intermediate risk for surgical aortic valve patients we are currently there are, irrespective of any risk the patient can be taken up for taver or saver provided he is a candidate for bioprosthetic valve so we go from a, the, we after ct scan we say we assess the site from which we have to go this is the these are all the catheters where we use uh, to identify the uh, femoral angio anatomy this is the femoral artery femoral head you can see the femoral artery getting bifurcated here the we after doing an angiogram we assess the site where exactly we need to uh, uh, stick the particular vessel this is very very important because the major vascular complication goes directly headed head with the mortality and morbidity uh, the the kind of size of sheath what we put it here is 14 to 16 french so just imagine your little finger that the your little finger is going to go into the femoral artery so we have to be extremely careful to identify the site uh, in selecting the site uh, which is going to get the big sheath in so after technically this is the way how we do it this is the aortogram picture which is the pigtail is kept at the base of this aortic valve and we are trying to we have cross the aortic valve with the al1 catheter here and this is the valve that is positioned exactly across the aortic valve what we showed in the animation video and the valve and the balloon is inflated to deploy the valve this is the final angiography picture the contrast being injected in the ascending aorta should not enter into the left ventricle here so if you, in the particular video you can see that no no not even few amount of dye is going that says that the valve is appropriately positioned this is a, this is a, this was done something 2 years before the patient is doing fine at the end of the procedure we always assess the uh, site in which we access the vessel look at this vessel this is the vessel where we have access there's no leak patient is doing fine we, uh, he was he got discharged after 48 hours this is another patient where whom we did the procedure uh, uh, last month, i mean this month beginning he had a severe tricnosis with a chronic idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura the platelets were something around 36000 uh, Uh, ctvs consulted elsewhere declined surgery and referred to a heart team for taver he is a intermediate risk for taver but considering the prior surgical decline declined for saver surgical aortic valve it became a class one indication for aortic valve replacement uh, incidentally he was also have found to have a kind of uh, completely closed vsd in his interventricular septum you can see the densely calcified aortic valve here which is almost stuck not opening at all So this is the aortic valve uh, continuous wave Doppler, which shows that the gradient across the aortic valve is something around 95 and 60. Anything more than 60 and 40 itself is severe aortic stenosis. This patient is living with severe aortic stenosis for the last six months, and he's symptomatic. He's not able to lie down. He's got history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. If you don't treat such kind of patient, the mortality, the event that is going to happen in this particular kind of individual is something around 50% at the end of two years. So th this patient was taken for procedure again. We assess this and at a stick site where exactly we are going to prick. So we identify a proper site, and then just like the previous videos, whatever we have discussed, we we identify we put a pigtail, do one did a ascending aortogram to localize where exactly we need to place the valve, and here again we use an AR two to cross the uh, aortic valve into the left ventricle. 
we did a pre dilatation this patient has got a bicuspid aortic valve whenever we have a bicuspid aortic valve we used to dilate it without uh, before going directly with the valve so that uh, we deploy the valve in a pro in a, in, an, in an expandable in a proper appropriate way you can see the amount of uh, leak that goes from the ascending aorta into the left ventricle the left ventricle cavity is so thin the amount of lvh is so much this patient has even had got a chest pain because of the increased left ventricle muscle demand the valve is appropriately positioned and we deployed the valve in this angio you can see that the contrast which is seen in the ascending aorta has is not entering into the left ventricle that means the valve is opposed well to the ascending aorta and the aortic annulus without any significant leak this is the final as a pelvic angiogram which says that which shows that there is no evidence of dissection or leak in this particular patient he got discharged after 4 4 to 5 days now he he had a little prolonged hospitalization because of his uh, platelet count with the platelet count of 36000 were pretty difficult to do any kind of procedure but we did it completely trans uh, percutaneous without even opening the artery by means of cut down so this is the uh, aortic valve of this particular patient before the procedure you can see severely calcified restricted motion and if you focus here the valve is opening like a new valve absolutely new, uh, new born valve without any significant amount of leak so in 2020 the decisions of doing a native uh, severe aortic valve stenosis procedure by means of saver and saver should be discussed with the patient any patient in whom a bioprosthetic valve is planned for an aortic position can be considered at least it should, should be evaluated for saver rather than it should be pushed for saver it should be evaluated for saver the option should be given to the patients the surgical risk for and saver risk for a particular individual should be uh, discussed with every patient along with his uh, the, any specific procedure can be selected by the heart team that involves patient surgeon in the intervention cardiologist cardiologist physician anesthesiologist and the uh, perfusion team transcatheter taver should be the norm in future long term 10 year follow up data in low risk trials are planned we will be getting the results in another couple of years heart team approach is very very essential in such patients future appears bright in these category of patients with a minimalistic approach we are able to save lives and improve the quality of life in our patients with this i would like to conclude my talk thank you sir dr nagarendra bhupathi for a exhaustive lecture and very informative thank you sir since it's a endowment oration no question is entertained if you have one or two questions you can ask okay you can raise a question mr dr kamalakanan raise a question sir you unmute yourself sir you unmute Sir, there seems to be an imported wall where there is a lot of difference in the expenditure. Is it advisable to go for the imported wall? The, that's a good question, sir. Uh, currently, the, the indigenous valve have been utilized in more than thousand patients. The results of the same is uh, at present looks good, but there is no head-to-head -head comparison between indigenous valve versus Western valve. The there is a study that is being conducted at present. It's called as landmark trial. Uh, once we get the data, I will, I will be able to answer this question comfortably. But as of now, if someone can, is only giving the data to them. Uh, we can't. Uh, unfortunately, as a physician, we won't be able to treat poverty. So we have. This is the data. What is available? This is the valve which is produced by approved by US FDA, utilized in more than three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand individuals globally over a period of ten years. <laughs> the valve in which you have used over thousand patients. the choice is patient page give uh, should be given to patient sir if an individual can afford a usfd approved valve on any fine day it should be a, it, it can be considered as compared to an indigenous valve where there's no head to head uh, comparison available thank you sir thank you sir now we move on to next